All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so last time we coded up our fourth order Rungakuta integrator, and we tested it out on a really interesting system, which was the Lorenz attractor. Okay, so we wrote two codes. We wrote an RK4 single step code uh, to integrate one time step from YK to YK plus one. Uh, we also wrote a function called Lorentz.m, which contained our vector field for the Lorentz equations. Um, and we integrated a single trajectory through the Lorentz equation. So I'm just going to remind you what that looks like in MATLAB. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we go back to MATLAB, we have this um, function y out equals rk4 single step. And it just runs through one dt of what we're, we're used to with this Runge-Kutta integrator. Our Lorentz equation, this dy equals Lorentz of uh, its inputs, simulates our Lorentz equation. Okay, so it's a function of t and y, time and space. And then it has three parameters, sigma, beta, and rho. And MATLAB prefers that our vector fields occur as column vectors. So dy is a column vector um, of the time derivatives of each of the components of y. And then we simulated the system. We plugged in our parameters, our initial condition. We created a time span. And then we wrote a for loop so that for every dt, we would crank our state through our Rungakata single step integrator one more dt. Okay, and then we plotted that against ODE 45. So I'm just going to run this. Uh, and we get this nice visualization of our trajectory and MATLAB's trajectory uh, tracing out this Lorentz chaos butterfly. Okay, so this is the, the butterfly attractor. Um, people say the butterfly effect because what it really means is that if I start at two very very close points uh, in space in this equation, I could end up on either one of these lobes or wings. Okay, so that's just a little bit of a review. Now today, what we're going to do is instead of looking at a single particle, we're going to investigate um, a large amount of particles passing through this vector field. So we don't just want to know where one you know, piece of speck of dust goes, we want to know where a grid of particles goes in the flow. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to cook up a for loop. Um, let's see if I can actually write this on the fly. <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm just going to show you what, um, what it looks like before I actually write the code. I'm just going to run my script. So here's my grid of particles. And you can see this grid of particles distorting in time. So every time they move, this is actually one dt of my algorithm running. So this is actually pretty slow. Um, this is running on my laptop right now. And this is what the volume is doing. Okay, I'm going to kill this and actually write the code. Okay, so what we're going to start with, uh, we're going to clear all of our memory. Uh, we're going to close all of our figures, clear all, close all. I'm going to add in uh, Lorentz's parameters for chaos. OK, so sigma equals 10, beta equals 8 thirds, and rho equals 28. Good. So now, instead of my initial condition being a single point, I want my initial condition to be a cube, a volume of particles. So my initial condition is a large cube of points. OK. So I'm just going to define a structure called my x vector from minus 20 in increments of 2 to 20. So I'm going to have my volume be 20, uh, minus 20 to 20, minus 20 to 20, and minus 20 to 20 in the x, y, and z directions. Um, and I'm going to have particles every spaced two apart. So I have x vec, y vec equals minus 20, and z vec uh, also equals minus 20 in increments of 2 to positive 20. So there's a really cool MATLAB command called mesh grid. Um, mesh grid is going to take, each of these are individual vectors, x vec, y vec, and z vec. 
And what mesh grid is going to do is actually give me large uh, arrays of particles distributed at the locations on these vectors. So I'll just show you what it does. Mesh grid x vec, y vec, z vec. Okay, I'm going to save this code. I'm going to call it sim Lorentz fast. No, slow. Good. And I'm going to run it. Okay, so what is the size of x vec? Any thoughts? What do you think x vec uh, should be the size of x vec? Well, maybe it's a 21 vector, something like that. Okay, it's a 21 size uh, column row vector, row one, two, yeah, a 21 size row vector. But what's great about mesh grid is that it actually spits out uh, an array of coordinates, x, y, z, x, y, z, x, y, z, where each of the x, y, and z are from this x vector, y vector, z vector. So my size of x naught is actually 21 by 21 by 21, right? This is the x coordinate for all of my points. Size of y naught again is 21 by 21 by 21. This is the y coordinate of all of my points. And size of z naught is 21 by 21 by 21. Okay, so I'm just going to say that my initial condition is, um, how do I want to say this? So I'm going to create this very big array of initial conditions where the first entry is the x coordinate. Um, the second coordinate is the y volume, the coordinate, the y coordinate at the volume. And the third uh, coordinate of my initial condition array is z naught. So what size is y ic going to be? Right, we know that x naught and y naught and z naught are each 21 by 21 by 21. So what's the size of y ic? That's right, it's size 3 by 21 by 21 by 21. So it's all three coordinates for every point in our volume. In fact, we can see that. Let's say, what is the size of YIC? And as we expect, it's 3 by 21 by 21. Good. OK, uh, so let's just see what these look like. We're going to plot three. Uh, that gives me a three-dimensional plot with three coordinates. We're going to plot YIC. Um, the first coordinate, y, i, c, the second coordinate, and y, i, c, the third coordinate. And if I just do three comma colon, it assumes I mean colons for all of the other dimensions, for all the array dimensions. And I want to plot this in red with a line width of two and a marker size of four. Okay, let's kill this and try again. Okay, so I actually don't want a line connecting these all. All of these particles are being connected in this plot, which doesn't make sense. So I'm going to make it our dot to tell it that I only want points for every data point. There we go. And I'm going to make my marker size a little bit larger. Okay, this is my cube of data. Pretty cool. Okay, and I'm going to run all of these particles through my vector field um, to see where they all go because I really want to know, I don't want to just know about one generic, one particle. I want to know, like, where do lots of particles go? <coughs> okay, good. And I'm going to do something kind of cool. I'm going to say axis. Uh, minus 40 to 40, minus 40 to 40, minus 40 to 40. I'm going to make my view at 20 degrees and 40 degrees. I think this is like the um, like theta phi coordinates. Um, you can do help view. What is it called? Azimuth and, uh, and elevation, right? So these are azimuth and elevation coordinates. That's nice of my camera, right, looking at these particles. And I'm going to say draw now. This is just to make it look kind of fancy, OK? So I'm going to run this. And now I have a nice view from a little far away looking at my grid of particles. Cool. 
Good. Um, so now what do we want to do? All right, so now we actually want to integrate these through the vector field. OK, so that was just setting up my initial conditions. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to compute, a, compute all trajectories. OK. Um, again, I want a dt of 0.01, which is what we used in the previous lecture. Uh, you could try making it smaller or making it bigger. This is kind of a sweet spot. I just played around with it on the single trajectory. I still want my duration to be 4. I'm going to integrate from time 0 to time 4. And my time span is uh, 0, comma duration. L is duration divided by dt. So I should be commenting this code. I'm doing a pretty sloppy job. This is the number of dt time steps in time span. Um, dt is my time step. Good. OK, good. And then uh, I'm going to say that my particles, y particles, is equal to my initial condition volume. OK? So now we actually get into the, the nitty gritty. We actually want to run particles through this integrator. OK? So first, I'm going to have a for loop. So for all of the dt's between 0 and duration, so for uh, for step equals 1 to big L. This is uh, each step in time. The time is going to equal step times dt. Good. And I actually wanted to output to the screen what the time is, because I, I want to know, you know how my integration is advancing. If it's taking a really long time, I might want to know like what my time is, my simulation time. OK, so now for every instance of time, we have to take this whole large volume of particles and step it a dt forward in time. OK? So the first thing we're going to try is we're just going to make a for loop to go through x, y, and z. We're just going to go through all of the points using a for loop, and we're going to integrate them each a dt forward in time. OK? Uh, and we're going to use our RK4 single step um, because it's kind of nice for this purpose. OK, so I'm going to say for i equals 1 to the length of my x vector, uh, x vec, good. For j equals 1 to the length of my y vector, for k equals 1 to the length of my z vector. OK, so this is a for loop, a nested set of for loops that's going to go through i for each of the y, for each x, then for each y, and then for each z. We're going to cover every particle in this box. Good. OK, and now our integrator needs to know which particle and what time we're integrating. So I'm going to say y input equals the coordinate of my particles, uh, the i, j, k coordinate of my particles. OK, so sorry, this is the. <laughs> y particles colon means the x, y, and z coordinate of the i, j, k particle. OK, i, j, and k label which particle in the volume I'm at. And then y particles colon i, j, k tells me I want all of the coordinates for that particle. That's what y in is. This is all chords for i, j, k particle. And now we integrate it through, just like we did before. y out equals rk4 single step at t comma y Lorentz, t comma y comma sigma beta rho, dt time and y in. OK, so rk4 single step takes in a vector field. And this vector field should be a function of time and y. So I am wrapping my Lorentz equation using a function handle, this at t comma y. Lorentz tells MATLAB that I want to lock in sigma, beta, and rho. These are numbers I've defined up above. I want to lock them in and only consider this to be a function of t and y. And then I'm telling RK4 single step what my dt is, what my time is, and what my current coordinates are. And it gives me new coordinates, y out. 
Okay, and then once we have this new position for our particle, we update that particle. So the new coordinates are y particles colon i, j, k. The new coordinates for my i, j, k particle is equal to y out. So my grid of particles is indexed by i, j, k. The first column tells me what the coordinates are, and they're all moving and warping in, in time. And, 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 and every dt, I want to plot something. So I'm going to plot three. I'm going to plot my y particles. Um, one colon, my y particles. Two colon, y particles. Three colon, and I'm going to plot this in r dot with the same plotting as above. Good, I think this will look nice. And I want the same view and the same axis and the same everything. Uh, okay, good. And then I can end. Okay, so this code uh, is pretty simple. It took a while to develop, but the idea is pretty simple, right? We have um, the Lorentz equation with some parameters. We have an initial condition cube now, right? We want to run, um, recall, we want to run all of these particles in this cube through our vector field. And so the way we do it is we just go through each of those particles individually and step them dt, then go to its neighbor and step it dt forward, its neighbor step it dt forward until we're done with the whole cube. And then we do the whole thing again for every dt in our simulation. So if I run this thing, if I hit F5 and run my, okay, I get an error. The error is because I spelled length wrong. So that's not so bad. Let's see if I get any more. <coughs> so I run this thing through and every dt, I can see my particles deforming uh, along the grid. Okay, so my volume of particles is now stretching um, along this vector field. But notice that it's terribly slow. I'm going to let it run for a little bit just so it sinks in uh, to you how slow this really is. Now, while we're watching this and thinking, I want you to be thinking to yourself, why is this so slow in MATLAB, right? I'm, I'm using a modern computer with a you know, high-end Intel processor and lots of RAM. Why is the simulation taking so long in my computer? It's just creeping along. Well, the answer is actually pretty straightforward. So the answer is that using nested for loops is very slow in MATLAB. So MATLAB is what's called an interpreted language, which means it's not compiled. Okay, so there's really two families of languages, compiled and interpretive languages. And I mean, your computer doesn't know what plot means, and it doesn't know what, um, it doesn't know what it means when you tell it to take sign of a number, right? You actually have to tell it what every single step means in some kind of binary instructions or hexadecimal instructions. So when you write a program in a compiled language, your computer compiles it into a list of machine instructions that your computer can carry out, like add one, subtract five, grab this number here and put it here and add one to it, right? It has a, a very, very simple set of instructions that carries out what we're looking for it to do. Okay, so MATLAB is not like that. It's not a compiled language. And so every single line of your script, it has to compile it in real time before it can run it. So the reason that having a nested for loop is so bad is that the really expensive part of this code, this RK4 single step, is inside three for loops. So MATLAB is recompiling this code over and over and over and over again, and actually compiling it is what takes the most time. Okay, so we can in principle make this code way faster by being a little bit clever. 
Okay, I'm going to kill this code because it's taking so long. Okay, so the kind of the issue here is that if I use nested for loops, MATLAB is very slow. I'm going to give myself a reminder so I don't ever do this again. I'm going to say this code is slow because MATLAB is not compiled and we use nested for loops to step through every IC initial condition in the cube, one at a time, dot, dot, dot. Okay, so there's a pretty simple alternative to this, but it takes a little bit of getting used to. So the solution to this problem is what's called vectorizing our computations. Okay, so MATLAB is all of the linear algebra in MATLAB. When you ask it to multiply two matrices or divide two matrices or factor a matrix or whatever you ask it to do, as long as you ask it on matrices and vectors, MATLAB is actually incredibly fast because it's calling, it's referencing a pre-compiled Fortran library called LAPAC, L-A-PAC, Linear Algebra Pack. It's one of the most highly optimized compiled Fortrans in existence. Um, pretty much any major aerospace industrial firm is doing their computations built on LAPAC. Every time you do a matrix multiplication on your, in MATLAB, you're using LAPAC. So what we would really like to do is swap out this nested for loop for some kind of a big matrix multiplication or some vectorized operation so that MATLAB can call the really, really fast compiled code instead of recompiling its own code every step, okay? Now, this idea takes a little bit of getting used to, so I'm gonna show you how it works, um, but it will definitely sink in why vectorizing your operations is so much better in MATLAB. Okay, so first things first. Um, my first simulation I called simulate Lorentz slow because it's slow. I'm gonna call this one simulate Lorentz fast because it's gonna be much faster. Okay, a lot of the code I'm just gonna copy over. Right, all of my initial conditions are basically the same. Good. Um, let's see if there's anything else I need. That looks pretty good. The part where I create my DT and my duration and my time span is also correct. I'm gonna keep that. Good. Um, but then the step where I actually integrate my particles, this is going to change a little bit, okay? So now I'm gonna say four step equals one to L, right? This is the number of time steps I'm doing. I still have to step through time. My time uh, equals step times dt, y out equals rk for single step at uh, t comma y Lorentz, t comma y comma sigma beta rho dt time y n. Uh, let's see. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to try and just give it my huge volume of initial conditions and see if it can integrate them. So let's just run it up to here. The first code's the same, I initialize a cube. The next code is basically the same. I create a time span, I see how many DTs I need to step. But if I look at the size of my initial conditions, recall it's three by 21 by 21 by 21. So the first three are the X, Y, and Z coordinates. And then the next three slots tell me which I, J, and K particle I'm talking about. So instead of integrating one particle at a time through this vector field, I'm going to try to take that huge three by 21 by 21 by 21 array and see if I can plug that in as my input. Okay, that's y out, then y in should equal y out after each time step, and I'm just gonna see if this runs. Okay, uh, I'm gonna call this sim Lorentz fast b, and I'm gonna run it. Okay, so my cube pops up, that means it initialized, but then I get a big error message. What does it say? It says error using plus matrix dimensions must agree, and it's in this function evaluation 
in RK4 single step. Okay, so R4, RK4 single step somehow doesn't like adding dt over 2 times f1 to y0. And the reason is that I need to take my Lorentz vector field and I need to tell it how to operate on this large 3 by 21 by 21 by 21 data structure. Okay, so I have uh, this Lorentz code. I'm going to copy it to a new code, which I call Lorentz 3D, or you could call it Lorentz vector if you like. Let's call it that, Lorentz vector. It still takes in T, Y, sigma, beta, rho, but now Y is really big. It's a ton of particles. It's a 3 by N by N by N matrix, and it's going to spit out a huge uh, set of DYs, okay? So all I have to do here, remember now y has, uh, so now y is now size 3 by n by n by n, where the last three slots are the i, j, k coordinates. All I have to do is every time I see a y, instead of y2, it's going to be y2 colon colon colon, right? This is the second coordinate for all of my particles. This is the first coordinate for all of my particles, third coordinate, uh, and so on and so forth. Let's make sure I'm not being sloppy. I don't want to forget anything. OK. And so what this means is that it still preserves the structure. It still knows that I'm adding, you know, for a given i, j, and k, I'm still computing the correct dy for that particle's coordinates, but I'm doing it for all of them all at once. This is what vectorization means. Um, so that's actually all there is, Lorentz vector. I've just told it that it's vectorized now. I go back to sim v. And here, instead of Lorentz, I try Lorentz vector. Um, and then just the final step, I would like to plot some output so it looks cool. Let's see what we can do. Uh, every time step, I'm going to plot 3, y out 1 colon, y out 2 colon, y out 3 colon, r dot, with a line width. Uh, I'm going to do the same line width from before. Now, there's this cool command view, which gives me the azimuth and elevation, but I can tell it that I actually want it to change with every dt. So I'm going to have 360 times step divided by L, 40. So this thing's going to actually rotate around, which is just going to look super cool. OK, my axis should stay the same. And I want it to draw now instead of later. OK. So hopefully I didn't break my code. Um, let's try to run this. So the big picture here is that we are, instead of having a for loop to count through all of the i, j, and k particles, we're running all of the particles through a dt all simultaneously. This is vectorizing the operation. And it's all using kind of matrix multiplication. So it's going to be really fast in MATLAB. Let's hope this works. OK, a little bit of a bug. Let's see where it could be. Plot 3, y out, y out. Uh, OK. Oh, I have two n's. That's bad. All right, let's try it again. Uh, OK. OK, I still have an error. I really need to try a little harder here. Um, OK, there's a small bug. Let me just see if I can find it really quick. Uh, sometimes it's helpful for you to see how I debug code. Um, y in equals y initial condition. y initial condition equals all of this stuff. Uh, I have a mesh grid. I have a correctly sized x vector time. OK, so RK4 single step 
at t y Lorentz vector t comma y sigma beta rho dt time y n. Okay. Let's see if this works. Okay, I'm reverting to the code that I know works just to see if it actually works. Good. Okay, so let's assume that there is just a tiny bug somewhere. Um, you guys can try to find it in the lecture or you could just use the correct code which is uploaded online. Um, this is essentially the exact same code. I just have a tiny bug somewhere. So let's watch this thing run. We're having the exact same cube of particles. We're running it through the vector field. And when I run this thing, look at how much faster it runs than just using three nested for loops. Pretty cool. Okay, just so you recall what the slow simulation looked like. This is exactly the same parameters. This is the slow simulation. This is what you get when you naively go through a volume of data using for loops to do some expensive computation on each particle. Okay? This is kind of the Achilles heel of MATLAB, and every good programmer worth their salt should be aware of this, um, this problem in MATLAB with nested for loops. Okay? It's so slow, I can't wait for it to finish. Um, it's still at time 0.14, okay? Going back to our fast code, I'm gonna hit F5. And in the background here, it's just cranking away. It's already at time two. Um, way, way faster to vectorize your code, okay? <coughs> now, some of you may have noticed that when I plot this thing, this y out, if I say size of y out, it's 3 by 21 by 21 by 21. But when I plot it, I'm just saying plot y out 1 comma colon, the, the x coordinate comma colon. And this is MATLAB's shorthand, so that instead of saying comma colon comma colon comma colon, I just want a list of all of the unspecified, uh, in all of the unspecified coordinates. So if I say size, of y out one comma colon comma colon comma colon. It should say I have an array of size one by 21 by 21 by 21, right? That's just the x coordinate at all i, j, and k. But now if I say size y out one comma colon, it's going to give me a big vector, or I guess a big row vector of size 21 times 21 times 21. It's just gonna take my cube and write all of the coordinates as a big list. Because I'm telling it, I don't care about the, the i, j, k structure anymore. Let's just make sure 21 times 21 times 21 equals 92, 61. Good. Okay, so I feel pretty good about that. That, um, that works. Okay, so the first kind of really important major point um, of this lecture is if you're going to be doing integration of lots of particles through a vector field, please use vectorized integration, okay? Don't write a for loop and do each one separately, one at a time. Find a way to run all of your particles through each DT um, simultaneously. And it's kind of cool, if you look at our RK4 single step, we actually didn't have to change anything about this. This is perfectly general. It doesn't matter what the shape of the Y vector is. This evaluates the vector field, it computes F1, F2, F3, and F4, and it adds them up in the correct way to give me the coordinates of Y out, whether it's a single particle or this cube of particles. So just go through step by step and think to yourself, what is the size or the shape of each of these objects? What is the size of F1? What is the size of F2? Okay, so that's cool. I'm just gonna run it again because I really like this code. I like watching particles mix up. And you see very rapidly they start to kind of adhere onto this butterfly pattern. Okay, after time of four. But what I find really interesting is um, 
let's look at an, a second initial condition, which is a smaller cube around a point. So here we looked at a huge cube of data that's kind of filling space and it's all mixing around. Let's try a smaller cube of data around the same point, around some point. So now I'm starting at this initial condition, minus 8, 8, 27. And I'm integrating uh, a grid of particles from minus 1 to 1 in x, minus 1 to 1 in y, and minus 1 to 1 in z. So this is a smaller cube. I'm just going to run the first part of the code so you can see it. Right? This is the same domain, but now we're in that little cube of particles up there. Okay? And let's watch what happens when I run this through. So you see very rapidly the particles start to stretch out, and within a very, very short amount of time, they're stretching out significantly. Okay, so that little cube of particles, you could say, maybe I actually don't know exactly where my particle is. Maybe that's where the uncertainty lies. And so here we see that after four seconds, with a little bit of uncertainty, this is where all of my final particle positions could be. They could be anywhere on this set. Um, which is actually quite um, quite disturbing, right? That, that means that um, there's a lot of uncertainty growing in the system. Let's look at another even smaller grid of particles. So here I'm going to start with these guys. Okay, so now we have a really tiny, tiny, tiny grid of initial particles about our nominal trajectory. And if I run these through, <coughs> Notice they stay together for significantly longer, but eventually they start to stretch out significantly. Okay? And you would find that no matter how tightly I grouped my initial cube of particles, if I integrate for long enough forward in time, they are eventually going to stretch out and kind of mix onto this uh, attractor, this butterfly pattern. And you will have no idea kind of how to tell which particle from which, OK? So this is really um, a profound uh, statement of uncertainty. And this is why Lorentz's model became famous and why the butterfly effect um, is in our common vernacular, right? So the butterfly effect says, I can be at two points neighboring in this tiny, tiny cube of initial conditions. And the only difference is that one of them is just slightly pushed off by some butterfly flapping its wings or whatever, after long enough, these particles end up in totally different places. Okay? And I think that the, um, the saying is that you know, a butterfly flapping its wings in Texas could form a tsunami uh, over Tanzania. I don't know. Uh, but you can see that just kicking your system a tiny, tiny little bit, even at the initial condition, a butterfly flapping its wings in Texas, right, can have this huge effect that these trajectories go to very different places um, after some amount of time. Okay, so this is one of the hallmarks of chaos. I'm going to run this video again as I talk. One of the hallmarks of chaos is what's known as sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So I run this uh, forward, and all of these particles started with very, very close initial conditions, but they were a little different. And apparently, as I integrate for a really long time, that those changes in initial condition become very large. They magnify in forward time. So the final position of my particles is extremely sensitive to where they started. Right? Depending on if you push it a hair to the left or right, it could go anywhere it likes on this butterfly attractor. OK, so this is the hallmark of chaos, um, sensitive initial condition, sensitive dependence on initial conditions. And it makes you start wondering, here I imposed a cube of particles that I'm integrating through my vector field. And that's how I have this kind of change in initial condition, right? All of the particles have slightly different initial conditions. But we found that our integration schemes actually introduce a small amount of error at every little dt. So the worry is that as I'm integrating my particle in time, the little errors every dt, we can think of those as 
changes in the initial condition of my trajectory from the true solution. And those are also going to stretch apart. So this is a very uh, kind of ominous message, which says that if I have a chaotic dynamical system, and they're pretty easy to come by, right? This was a simple uh, set of equations Lorentz cooked up. I really have to worry about whether or not the tiniest of errors in my integrator are going to amplify into a large amount of uncertainty at future points in time, okay? So today we covered vectorized integrators and we just started to touch upon chaos, um, which is a really cool phenomenon. It's ubiquitous in modern engineering um, and it's kind of the scourge of most numerical integrators. And so next time, we're going to say a few more words on when you can and cannot trust your integrator, some words on chaos, um, and we're gonna do some neat kind of examples of of chaotic dynamical systems and particle trajectories. Okay, so that's all for now, um, and I'll see you next lecture.